And that's usually one of the first things I will ask is, um, can you, do you understand what diabetes is? And I can't, I don't know exactly percentage, but I would say the majority of people would say no. Um, or I'd ask, you know, have you ever taken any type of cooking classes? Um, or do you know uh, a diet that's specific for diabetes? Do you know how to count carbohydrates? Um, do you know how insulin works? And they would have a mother and a father that um, are, already had diabetes. And them themselves would have had diabetes sometimes for five, 10, 15 years. And they never spoke to a professional about what diabetes is. So this is the Healthy Lifestyle Solutions podcast. And I'm your host, Maya Acosta. If you're willing to go with me, together we can discover how simple lifestyle choices can help improve our quality of life. Let's get started. Type 2 diabetes has been called the Black Death of the 21st century in terms of its exponential spread around the world and its devastating health impacts. More than 20 million Americans are currently diagnosed with diabetes, a tripling of cases since 1990. At this rate, the CDC predicts that one in three Americans will be diabetic by mid-century. Currently in the United States, diabetes causes about 50,000 cases of kidney failure, 75,000 lower extremity amputations, 650,000 cases of vision loss, and about 75,000 deaths every year. Join me as registered dietitian John Massengale speaks to us about the prevalence of diabetes, the causes, and the long-term complications of having diabetes. Learn about what you can do to prevent, and in some cases, reverse diabetes through healthy lifestyle solutions. As always, the full bio and the links for each of my guests can be found on the podcast website, healthylifestylesolutions.org. And also as a bonus, I'm giving you a diabetes info sheet that comes from PCRM. Simply go to bit, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash diabetes sheet, and you will receive a guide with information on diet and diabetes. In our newsletter, we send out information about upcoming diabetes classes as well. So I hope that you enjoy this episode. So welcome, John. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Well, I, I should let our listeners know that we know each other uh, from this lifestyle world that we live in. And so I'm in Dallas and you're in Fort Worth. And I always think it's a longer distance than it probably is. But is it about an hour trip between both cities? Uh, but it depends on what interstate you take. Um, I'm really close to I-30 and really it's a straight shot. I would say probably 30 minutes, uh, 30, 35 minutes if you go straight from downtown, one downtown to the other. Okay. All right. Just depends, it, but it also depends on traffic. So, <laughs> so in all my years that I've been in Dallas, which have been about ten years now, probably, um, I've only been to Fort Worth like three, maybe five times. I I don't oh know, but um, oh. I, I'm beginning to be more drawn. And the last time I was there, we we went to this Mexican restaurant that was fully plant based, and it was like wow. But yeah, anyway, I, I'd like our listeners to know that we know each other from uh, this circle. And the last time that we saw each other was at the Tulsa Veg Fest, which I had been promoting on the podcast. And you were yeah. there for the dinner experience, which was a lot of fun. Yes. And uh, yeah, how was it for you? What did you think? Oh, it was great. Um, it was a good chance to meet. Uh, and I, uh, the only time I'd spent some time in Tulsa was... When I went back to school, I did my dietetic internship at Oklahoma, at OU in Oklahoma City, and we did a day trip to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And so it was a great opportunity to get back to Tulsa, spend time there, um, and get to meet people, like-minded people, uh, listen to Dr. Uh, Loomis talk, and just uh, really get, also just get back out there and just talking to people. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. Awesome. And get to see yourself and Dr. Riz. Oh, catch up. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. It was great. Charming little city. John, when I first met you, you I, I believe I already knew that you were a dietitian at the time. And then you moved. We knew each other briefly. We met. And then you moved to Corpus Christi. And next thing I know, you're specializing in diabetes. And so I'd like to learn all about that. I have so many questions that I have listed here. Um, but first, I'd love to learn your story of how you got on board. Why did you choose dietetics? Okay. Um, 
probably going a little bit even further back than when I decided to go back to school. My health experience, and I believe uh, like my time when I decided to look at my own personal health was um, after my dad passed away of heart disease back in, in 2006. Um, and around that same time, um, I was working at a job. I was commuting a lot here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And so uh, that was a wake-up call for myself. I started looking at my own health. Um, and I'd recently um, had a visit to my uh, primary care physician, which ironically, this, uh, this recently, the, uh, I saw him not too long ago, probably about four or five months ago, to get my blood work and do my annual physical exam. And he actually retired. And he had been my primary care physician for, I don't know, about 30 years. Um, so around that same time, around 2006, 2007, um, I was overweight. Um, uh, I had high cholesterol, um, and uh, my doctor, my primary care physician, gave me a stern warning. He said, "You know, you really need to start looking at your your health. You need to start uh, looking at your diet. Um, you need to start exercising more." And so, um, again, yeah, that was a wake up call for me. He gave me a pamphlet on the Mediterranean diet. Um, and really just sort of sent me on my way at that time. I didn't even really, I don't think at that time, knew there was things called registered dietitians. So um, so anyway, so I, I spent the next uh, several years uh, starting to get into exercising, uh, mountain biking, which led to road biking, which led to doing triathlons. And what I quickly realized is that you can't out-exercise out a bad diet. So that led me to nutrition uh, and studying nutrition and how to not only fuel myself as an endurance athlete, uh, but also how can I potentially help people like my father, you know, maybe catch it earlier, be, uh, you know, catch it in the earlier uh, signs. And, and, uh, and at the same time, at the job I was at, it just didn't feel like I had much of a purpose at that job. It was a uh, more of a corporate uh, in the financial services industry. Um, so from there, uh, I uh, my introduction to the plant based world um, actually happened. It was uh, actually at a, at a triathlon training camp in Las Vegas, Nevada. Believe it or not, uh, there was a bunch of triathletes there, and we were all staying at this house in Henderson, Nevada. Um, and so when I first got to the house, um, I walked in and all, there were all these crates of bananas and mangoes and papayas. And I was like, what is going on here? And I was, uh, I grew up with a Southern diet, uh, you know, in, in Texas, Mississippi is my upbringing, you know, eating meat, chicken, uh, with some of my staples, eggs. Um, and so I started talking to the people that were hosting the, they were triathlon coaches and they told me about a plant-based diet. That was my first, uh, one of my first introductions to a plant-based diet. And so for there, um, uh, they, I said, Hey, I want to learn more because they were blending up these big smoothies and that was, they would go for these long three, four hour rides and come back and get out their Vitamix and, and put all these, you know, uh, all these bananas and mangoes and that's really all they were having. I, and I was like, where's your protein? And so, uh, so from there, they told me to watch the, the, the documentary forks over knives. Um, and from there, uh, that started my, uh, my interest in going back to potentially going back to school. Um, and then, uh, uh, I had also, uh, had been dating a, a, a female in, in Dallas, uh, before, and this is, I actually moved to Denver around that same time. Uh, in the, uh, she was a dietitian. So, um, I started getting interested from that relationship. And then eventually again, the forks over knives. And, uh, I made that, that sort of that light bulb moment went off after watching that diet, uh, the, di the documentary, um, in the link of, um, having uh, more of an animal based diet and potentially, you know, ca the cause of things like cardiovascular disease and diabetes. It's incredible the effect that that movie has had, Forks Over Knives, 
and how it has impacted so many people. And for my listeners who have not seen it, please go watch it, Heart Disease. It's the number one killer of Americans. So I'm so glad that you, you're you sharing that. And so to remind ourselves that we are always, if we're not taking care of ourselves, we are at risk, not only for diabetes, but heart disease. I don't know if I ever mentioned to you that, uh, yes, I learned, I came about learning all this information when I saw the book, Dr. McDougall's book, The Start Solution, but really it was a vegan athlete on uh, YouTube that I learned about. She used to go by the Banana Girl. Okay. Uh, do you know Freely the Banana Girl? Freely, Freely the Banana Girl, you're right. <laughs> yeah. It was like 30 bananas or... Yeah. Like yeah. So when you're describing all, you know, seeing all these fruits uh, around and doing the smoothies, and that's when I first probably had, I already had a Vitamix, I want to say. But the thing is that she really, seeing her, a living example that you can be an endurance athlete and look great and have energy mm -hmm. is what got me on board. Do you still stay in, in touch with these people? No, they're, they're actually in Colorado. It's actually Pete and Kathy Alfino. Um, they actually run a coaching triathlon service called uh, Mile High Multisport. And they were living in Denver uh, at the time. And now they've uh, moved to, um, let's see, uh, Steamboat Springs. Um, and so I've moved back from after when I went back to school in Denver, um, after I got my degree, I moved back to the DFW area. So oh, okay. um, I haven't. And I sort of after when I decided to go back to school in 2014, um, I, uh, did an Ironman that year. Um, I haven't really done any, I think I've done maybe yeah, I've done one triathlon since then. So I've sort of gotten out of the triathlon world and stick more to, uh, really, um, it, most of my time is dedicated to learning about nutrition, uh, you know, uh, starting a different, a new career, um, and also, um, having my own personal coaching business. Um, and so, Mostly I'm do as far as exercise is I did the Cowtown Marathon. I'm part of a running group here in Fort Worth and um, I'm planning to do my first gravel ride. I did Leadville 100 mountain bike race last year. So I okay. still do endurance. Uh, it's just the, the time commitment to uh, iron, uh, training for triathlons because you have to do swim, bike and run. It's really hard to fit it in, but I'm starting to actually get the itch to possibly sign up for an, an Iron Man in the next couple of years, so awesome. so I'm not still still not in touch with them, but I'm still I'm sure they're they're still active in the triathlon community. Mm -hmm. Yes, what I gather from you just from our brief conversations that we've had is that you are very focused and very passionate about what you're doing right now. And, yes. um, and that's why I was excited. One of the reasons I was excited to have you on the show. So I think early when I met you and we talked about your, um, your studies as a dietitian, I may have even asked, like, do they recommend whole food plant-based uh, diet lifestyle as the optimal way of eating for, for people in general? And I think you, you kind of said, no, they don't. Yeah, it was a it was surprising. Um, I think that when I went back to school in 2015, um, the one th thing that was happening about the same time is Netflix, uh, and so documentaries were just slowly starting to come out. Um, as far as from a curriculum standpoint, um, I uh, I had a few uh, of my nutrition focused um, classes that had to do with human nutrition. Um, that still followed more of your your standard uh, omnivore type of diet, um, and so and I would even talk to the professor after class and I'd say, "Hey, look at look this, you know these types of animal proteins. They you know can create things like TMAO and and IGF one and things that are more inflammatory." Um, and he would always you know um, sort of brush me off and. And so I just think that maybe the the sign of the times, uh, just the information, the studies were just starting to come out, the research. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, there were just maybe a little, the information was just slowly coming out at that point. So um, so I just did my, really, I did my own thing. That's what I've always done. I, I know that the science, I know uh, it works for myself. Um, it works. Uh, the, so many studies um, were coming out at the time. 
Uh, there was so much research. Uh, you know, I always think of uh, Dr. Garth Brooks, uh, proteinaholic, uh, you know, because we are so protein obsessed, especially coming from Texas. Um, and so it, it's just the information I, bought, I thought was overwhelming, but they didn't really teach it at that point. Um, and my understanding um, at places like uh, Oklahoma University, um, they have a more plant-based focus curriculum, uh, a, a class or two. Um, so I think universities are starting to take that on uh, over the last several years. Well, it's good to know that the information is getting out. You know, uh, John, I, I've said in the past, I, I don't have a background in nutrition, but I did. I took a nutrition class and then I stopped eating red meat and pork in college. And I spend most of my life trying to figure out how to eat or at least trying to be a vegetarian slash pescatarian. So I, I often purchase books. So I did research on my own. And yet I still felt lost. And, and I can imagine how many people feel lost right now, unless they are guided towards the right information. And so I often go across the street to my half price bookstore. And I go to sort of the health section, because I'm always looking for books to give away. And you have all the diets, all sorts of diets are blended with health information, which in dieting, you know, restricting along with other fad diets. And, um, and so I, I, I stand there sometimes and I think, wow, that's why people are so lost. This is what there's just, it's all blended into one category. Uh, today, we know that there are fields dedicated to this information. We know that what we talk about is evidence-based. There's science behind this, and we direct people towards the right materials. So let's talk about, um, having said that, let's talk about how you made your way towards specializing in diabe uh, diabetes. Was that when you moved to, um, did that transition happen when you moved to Corpus Christi? Yeah, I think uh, eventually it did. It was probably halfway through my time at Corpus Christi. Um, I, uh, that was my first, as it, it maybe taking a little bit of a step back. Um, when you, usually when you leave uh, your university and get your degree, um, the next step is to, become, to do an internship, which I did, again, I think I mentioned at Oklahoma University. And the, um, the reason you take an internship is so you can actually spend time in all these different areas of being a dietitian. So I spent time, as an example, at the VA hospital in both the clinical setting and in the food service uh, section of the VA hospital. I spent time at the Oklahoma Heart, Heart Hospital, which is uh, more of the intensive cardiac rehab that I'll be talking about eventually. Um, I spent time at the uh, Oklahoma School District to get an idea of how how dietitians play a role in uh, school nutrition. Uh, I spent time at the uh, Indian Clinic because there's a lot of uh, high Indian ethnic population in Oklahoma. So, and and again, the the reason you do that do that so is you can get a feel for what area of nutrition you want to specialize in. And so after doing that, I still didn't know. So, so, uh, so usually a, a good default is if you do have an interest in clinical nutrition, which I did have an interest. Um, and the, re the reason I have an interest in, in clinical nutrition is that um, there's a part, there's a, there's a science, and then there's an art to uh, clinical nutrition. The science part is using evidence-based solutions to help your patients. Um, but also there's a subjective and objective part of being a, a clinician. Um, objective is looking at things like lab values, like A1C, cholesterol levels, uh, um, C-reactive protein, which is an a, a indication of inflammation. Um, but also there's a more of a, a, a subjective part, which is how the patient presents, which is, you know, how do they feel? Do they, are they fatigued? Do, um, are they... Um, are their energy levels high or low? Um, so I was fascinated by understanding from the patient and interviewing the patient. And it's called the actual process is called in the nutrition care process, which is a, a four step process. The first step is an assessment uh, portion where you do a physical assessment. You're looking for nutritional deficiencies with the patient. Um, you're also doing a background of their family history. You know, do, is there a history with diabetes or cardiovascular disease in the family. 
then you're looking at the typical food and you know, their 24 hour diet recall, what types of foods that they're eating. Um, so you do a full assessment. You look at your, the anthropometrics like BMI, um, which is an indication of, you know, if they're in a healthy weight range or if they're overweight, or even I saw a lot of malnutrition people that were underweight. Um, so after spending time uh, talking to patients and uh, doing the nutrition care process, um, I started to realize um, that there were so many people in Corpus Christi in South Texas that suffered from either pre-diabetes or diabetes. Um, and so from there, um, toward the end of uh, the time I was at uh, the hospital, we had a dietitian that came and talked to us from one of the major dialysis uh, companies. Um, and when she came and she talked to the dietitians at the hospital, she talked about how um, the, uh, uh, for in the renal world and in, in dialysis clinics, her company is taking a more plant-based approach to nutrition. And so that really poked my ears up and I was like, okay. So from there uh, to become a, to become a certified diabetes care and education specialist, um, there is a prerequisite. You have to have um, logged a thousand hours of clinical time with diabetes patients. Um, so I started tracking how many hours I was spending in the hospital, and I knew I still needed a lot of hours. And about that same time, it was about a year and a half uh, that I was at the hospital, COVID had um, started to come in the Corpus Christi area. So I found there's an opportunity to maybe go back to the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I was getting homesick. Um, and then from there, that's when I uh, realized that um, one of the two leading causes of chronic kidney disease, which can lead to end-stage renal disease, which is dialysis, which we require that dialysis, the two leading causes are high blood pressure and diabetes. So I knew um, that if I became a renal dietitian, that I'd be able to speak to a lot of people and work with a lot of patients that had diabetes. Um, and so uh, but I also have an interest in cardiovascular. And that's one thing I love about being a dietitian and nutrition in general is that there's so many areas of nutrition. There's so many specialties, uh, whether it's intuitive eating, uh, eating disorders, uh, you know, uh, working with people with cystic fibrosis um, to, again, uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, cardiovascular. And uh, what I like about diabetes um, in particular is that it is probably the number one chronic, chronic disease that you can affect through lifestyle modification. Uh, and there's studies that back that. There's the, the Finnish uh, uh, the Finnish uh, diabetes prevention study and the di diabetes prevention program, D DPP, that have proved that, um, that lifestyle over medications are one of the best ways that you can help prevent if you have pre-diabetes or if you do have diabetes. So, um, which I'm a big believer in lifestyle medicine. So from there, I just, uh, you know, kept logging the hours. Uh, and then eventually uh, became a certified diabetes educator, passed the uh, board exam approximately six months ago. Congratulations. But you are in the perfect field to help create change and to empower patients. Diabetes is the number one chronic condition that could be the most affected by just making tweaks and, and changing our diet. What is the percentage, if you happen to know, what is the percentage of improvement or even preventing diabetes? If you're, I believe if your A1C is between 5.7 and 6.4, um, then you're considered a, a pre-diabetic. Um, but, you know, the two main things that are driving, so maybe even taking a little step back, that, step back from that, is that the, um, the two underlying things that start to create that inflammation in the body. Um, number one is that the pancreas is not secreting enough insulin. Um, so that's usually one thing, and you can measure that by testing C-peptide is the uh, test that you can uh, run to get an idea of how much insulin that your pancreas is secreting. 
Um, so a lot of times it's more of a pancreas that's just been sort of overworked. Um, and the second underlying cause of diabetes is insulin resistance, meaning that um, when we eat food, um, the food for it to work properly it needs to get inside of the cell, whether it's in the muscle cell or inside the fat cell. Um, so when that food, and especially glucose, gets up to the cell, um, the cell starts to re reject that uh, insulin, meaning that the insulin goes up to the cell. And insulin, uh, and I like how uh, the guys from Mastering Diabetes, uh, Robbie Barbero and, and Cyrus Kambata put it, is that basically insulin gets up to the cell wall and says, knock, knock, I've got some glucose, I want to bring it in the cell. And so when the cell becomes insulin resistant, it doesn't recognize the insulin. So those are the two underlying drivers of diabetes, um, which the causes of those are multifactorial. Um, and it uh, can depend on uh, your, uh, it could be ethnic, your groups, the you see higher prevalence in uh, Asian Americans, uh, African Americans, um, the Native American populations, mm -hmm. Um, also, if you have a family history, um, someone in your family's had diabetes in the past. So, um, and then from there, it becomes there's a lot of underlying lifestyle um, causes, uh, you know, being uh, inactive, um, eating the sort of a standard American diet, uh, which causes uh, weight gain and uh, for you to be overweight, um, high stress, um, and other things. Um, like, uh, you know, just, you know, feeling good. Um, so there's a lot of things that can factor into causing that, those two main drivers of diabetes, which again is uh, the pancreas not secreting enough insulin and insulin resistance at the cell level. Okay. Uh, before we focus a little bit more on the role that nutrition plays in terms of contributing to insulin resistance, before we talk about that, are there physical symptoms that people begin to have or they're starting to develop diabetes? Yeah, I think that the, the, some of the main symptoms are, number one, is fatigue. Um, if someone is not getting the glucose inside the cell, they're going to feel fatigued because glucose, after it gets into the cell, it actually goes into the mitochondria, which turns into energy, ATP. So number one is being more fatigued. Um, second is that uh, you tend to go to the restroom more often um, and your thirst increases. So those are a few of the main symptoms uh, that there could be something, you know, uh, happening at the cellular level. So say a person feels like they might be at risk. Uh, you, you, you said there are many factors that contribute to that lifestyle. How huge of a role does nutrition play? If, if it's the number one chronic condition that is highly affected by eating plant-based foods, then how much of a role um, do other foods play in contributing to the development of diabetes? That's a good question. Um, well, nutrition plays a very big role. Um, if you, and I heard it this, I forgot who described it this way, but if you think of a puzzle um, and there being several puzzle pieces to the puzzle, Nutrition uh, and being active um, and stress and uh, um, feeling connected, uh, sleep patterns. If you think of those all being a uh, piece of a puzzle, nutrition is the biggest piece. Okay. And so, and, and why is that? And it's because that uh, the studies show um, that uh, with weight loss, uh, you can help reduce with, you know, seven to 10% weight loss. You can re reduce your A1C and your insulin resistance. Um, so what does that mean? Um, it means eating a nutrient rich, but you have to reduce your calorie intake. And so when you eat a whole food plant-based diet, a lot of the things that you'll be reducing is going to be refined grains as long as you're increasing your your whole grain intake. And so why is that important? Well, whole grains are complex carbohydrate, which is going to uh, be lower on the glycemic index, which the glycemic index has to do with 
how big of an impact when you eat a carbohydrate has on your blood sugar levels. Um, so uh, versus more refined grains and sugars. Um, also, when you eat a whole food plant-based diet, you're going to be reducing your salt intake, uh, which salt um, can lead to e increased eating, uh, so increased calorie intake. Um, and then lastly, when you eat a whole food plant-based diet, you're going to be eliminating animal proteins. And animal proteins are where you'll find most of the saturated fat in a diet. Um, in saturated fat, we can, as humans, we can consume saturated fat, but we can only consume so much of it. Um, and it becomes more inflammatory. And fat has nine calories per per gram versus carbohydrates have four, four calories per gram and protein has four calories per gram. So when you eliminate or uh, reduce animal products, when you significantly reduce animal products, you're reducing the amount of fat that you have in your diet, which fat and especially saturated fat um, has been linked to insulin resistance because the saturated fat gets inside of the cell um, and it's called an intramyocellular lipid, which increases the insulin resistance inside the cell. Um, so the advice of the American Diabetes Associated, Association is one of the recommended dietary patterns. There's three main dietary patterns that they recommend. Uh, number one is a Mediterranean diet, which has a lot of really good benefits because it is more plant-based. Uh, number two is a low-carbohydrate diet. Um, and then three is a vegetarian uh, or plant-based diet. Those are the, the dietary patterns that the American Diabetes Association recommends because, again, you're eating these whole foods that should help with the weight loss, which is one of the key drivers of reducing insulin resistance and A1C. Um, and then, again, you'll be crowding out those things like um, uh, refined grains, salt, which causes, again, overeating and saturated fat, which causes too many, too many calories and the insulin resistance inside of the cell. I actually think you explained it very well. Can we talk about what, uh, what it looks like when, a, when diabetes is not well managed? They go home after they've been diagnosed and don't make any significant changes. What are the consequences of, of living with diabetes? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, number one, I think the, the, it starts with the, the smaller, th or let's say smaller, the things that um, aren't as, again, more of the subjective things, the things we can't put a number on, which are feeling more fatigued, less energy, um, having to, again, urinate more often, uh, more trips to the bathroom, uh, probably feeling more lethargic, uh, you, know, um, you know, are some of the initial signs. Um, but the things that are more downstream, because one thing with diabetes and type two diabetes, I sort of think of it as swimming against the current. Um, if you ever swam in a river, you know, when you first get in and, the, and maybe the current's not, you know, really going too hard, um, it's kind of easy. You sort of, you know, okay, you start to deal with it. Um, but as time goes on, if, if diabetes is not managed properly, it's a, a disease of progression. The current will get harder and harder. Um, and so some of the other things um, is that uh, you'll, if you're not in uh, control of your diabetes, you can go what's called hypoglycemic, meaning uh, especially when you start to take medications like insulin. Um, and if you're not, and if you're skipping meals because that insulin is expecting a meal to come in, and so what it, that can do is make someone actually go low glycemic. Uh, again, so they're going to be uh, lightheaded, um, maybe even uh, uh, shaky um, or some signs of low glycemia. And that's below 70 uh, milligrams per deciliter, I believe it is. Um, uh, signs of being um, high, hyperglycemia um, are, again, things that, uh, you just, uh, you know, you, you may even need to be hospitalized. I've had some patients that had to be hospitalized because their sugars are even too high. Uh, but what happens downstream 
uh, from internally, it affects your whole body. Um, so macro vascular types of uh, things that are happening uh, are going to be uh, cardiovascular disease, peripheral arteries disease, strokes, um, and then microvascular uh, types of uh, diseases will be uh, retinopathy. Um, I've had many patients that have either lost eyesight in one eye or are totally blind. Um, also, they'll start to lose feeling in their feet and they'll have ulcers that will become, uh, will get out of control because they don't even feel it because they have lost their feeling in their, their feet. So, uh, so more of a neuropathy and that can lead to a loss of blood flow to those areas as well and potential amputations. Um, and so... Uh, the downstream effects um, are uh, if you don't uh, have a good control, um, uh, you know, those are some, some things that happen. And I've seen it in, in the clinical setting in Corpus Christi, um, and I've seen it uh, with the patients, uh, you know, in, in the dialysis clinic. So um, these, these things um, can be easily avoided by you know, just really... Uh, controlling, checking your blood sugars. And what's great is the, you know, if you, uh, this uh, continuous glucose monitor, CGMs, um, uh, the technologies out there. And so uh, that's part of my job is to, is to help people um, with behavior change and, and and help them in those areas. If you want to spend a few minutes talking about your experience in cardiac rehab, can then how you come to now develop your own programs where you're coaching one-on-one, -on -one. and do you also do group coaching? Yes. So when I was in Corpus Christi, um, I um, one of the things that I felt was missing um, was a missing opportunity to affect people um, on a longer-term basis, um, because one of the drawbacks uh, are, are just for people in general, one of the probably the few times that they'll ever come in contact with a healthcare professional, unfortunately, is in the hospital setting. Uh, sometimes uh, they'll just put off uh, some things that they need to take care of until they actually have to go to a hospital, which, which I can totally understand. Um, and so uh, once they get to the hospital, then uh, I don't know the exact rate, but the referral rate to a dietitian, um, I don't think is very high. And even if I did get a referral and get a consultation from, let's say, a cardiologist um, or for diabetes education, I would get to the room and they'd already be discharged. Um, so they'd already left and gone home. So, uh, but, you know, you try, try to put myself in the patient's shoes. It's a when, when I did get to meet with patients in the hospital, in the inpatient setting, um, it's a tra traumatic experience for those people. Um, and you've got, they've got people coming in and out of their room on a, uh, probably an hourly basis. It's probably really hard for them to get any rest. Um, we're asking questions, we're probing. Um, and so uh, it was, it was a, a big challenge to be able to um, create habit change or behavior change in the five or seven minutes that I had with the patient uh, in the inpatient setting. And so what I thought was a, a big need was to uh, meet people on their own terms. And so um, the part of the hospital that I was at, they had a cardiac rehab uh, division of the hospital where people, people would come back on an outpatient setting on their own schedule uh, and so they would come and they would exercise. And, and so, um, I remembered the experience that I had at the Oklahoma heart hospital in uh, Oklahoma city. I spent about two months there and it was one of the, uh, the best experiences I had because patients would come in, uh, they would exercise, uh, they would um, have a reg uh, registered nurse monitoring, their, their vitals, they would have an exercise physiologist monitoring uh, their vitals as well and helping them exercise and get the heart pumping. Um, and then they would go to classes and watch videos on diet, um, uh, cooking classes on how to eat with less salt and less fat, eat more plant-based. And so I wanted to bring that back uh, and do that in, in the hospital. Um, and so 
I just went over to the cardiac rehab. To, they didn't have that there. So I went over there one day with my boss, uh, Kayla, if you're out there, um, you know, I, uh, she was one of the best bosses ever. So hopefully she sees this at some point. Um, so she was very open. She's like, let's go talk to him. So we talked to him, said, hey, I want to um, talk to the patients because, again, they're coming on their terms. And so they can uh, be in a more comfortable position to learn. Uh, I want to do some cooking demos, talk about uh, the Nathan Pritikin protocol, which is a flexitarian diet, which is more plant based. Um, and so they were like the, the people over there were like they were game. And so um, I, we were able to fit in uh, once a month. I would do a cooking demo. People would even still be on their exercise bikes while I taught the cooking demo. And I would do a presentation on uh, how to transition to eating more plant-based, less animal proteins, uh, eating with less salt, um, using healthy fats uh, like monounsaturated, polyunsaturated fats like avocados, nuts and seeds, um, things like omega-3. Um, and so um, it was a great experience. And then I, that led to doing outpatient consulting with the patient. So uh, that's where I could start to practice motivational interviewing, which is, you know, coming alongside the patient, being a partner, trying to tech, take off that expert hat, because I think that, uh, you know, from the patient standpoint, um, nobody wants to be told what to do. So, you know, really, you know, uh, finding out the patient's why, why do they want to make a change? Maybe they have someone in the family that you know, uh, they want to see a graduation or a grandkid that, uh, and then second is really coming to shared and collaborating with the patient on what they want to accomplish. Uh, and just really, uh, you know, shining a light on maybe the ambivalence they have on making change, because it's really hard at the end of the day to, you know, adopt a new way of eating, um, and to, uh, start an exercise program. And so, uh, that, uh, then after, you know, speaking to patients, starting, you know, smart goals, which are specific goals, um, because it can be overwhelming trying to take on a whole new diet style. So smart, uh, you know, just establishing specific small goals, uh, which once they accomplish those, uh, the goal of a dietitian ultimately is to help build their self-confidence that they can do these things that that self-reliance um, and they, they can make those changes. So that went on for probably about six months, a monthly um, uh, cooking demo, and then uh, started with the outpatient uh, con uh, consultations with patients and then COVID hit. And so that only lasted for a few weeks. And so they shut, shut everything down. But um, because uh, probably the biggest thing I learned, and this goes to more of the art of being a dietitian is that uh, you know, motivational interviewing, understanding what the patient wants to accomplish is the art of being a dietitian because it's so easy for us to have the expert hat on and just, you know, be because we're very passionate about nutrition and exercise to go in and say, hey, these, you know, you need to start doing this and this is the, this is going to fix everything. All you need to do is do this. But I quickly realized that people would shut down you know, when you, you know, uh, you know, have that expert hat on and it's really um, being more of a partner with the patient, uh, I believe, is what shows in the science is what helps people make that those those behavior changes in their life. Right. It's about building trust in a sense. Yeah. It's uh, I'm trusting you that you know what's best for me because apparently I don't <laughs> in a way that's kind of what it feels like but um, I'm also wondering having had your experience you know in uh, South Texas Corpus Christi is a little further south so there is more of a Latinx community there I'm wondering if you can kind of give me some insight to that I had a dietitian on Lily Correa uh, mm -hmm. who you may know uh, she was on a couple of years ago and talking about how she did a hospital visit, kind of like what you were talking about, these missed opportunities where you may see the patient. And if you do, it's only for a few minutes. And she walked mm -hmm. into this room where it was full of, you know, Hispanic, the Hispanic family was there. Yeah. And um, she spoke to them in Spanish. And she said to the patient, have you ever received diabetes education? Yeah. And the, the individual said no. 
and she just like her heart just broke you know and she started she t on that whiteboard where they put the physician name and all of that Lily started to explain what nutrition looks like for diabetics and um, she that's when she realized I need to work more closely with people in Spanish who lack this information. What has been your experience with, with Spanish-speaking people? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, yeah, I think that uh, my experience is very similar to what you're describing in that a lot of times when I, one of the first things I do when I walk into a room and first introduce myself, I want them to have a good understanding of what I do um, and that I'm a registered dietitian, um, and that I'm really there just to help and to understand what their needs are. And that's usually one of the first things I will ask is, um, can you, do you understand what diabetes is? And I can't, I don't know exactly percentage, but I would say the majority of people would say no. Um, or I'd ask, you know, have you ever taken any type of cooking classes? Um, or do you know uh, a diet that's specific for diabetes? Do you know how to count carbohydrates? Um, do you know how insulin works? So um, uh, a lot of those questions, a lot of times they would, and they would have a mother and a father that um, are, already had diabetes. And them themselves would have had diabetes sometimes for five, 10, 15 years. And they never spoke to a professional about what diabetes is. So. Um, at that point, um, it, I try and keep everything very basic um, and try to uh, ask them, what would you like to, for me to explain? Uh, where, where would you like for me to start? What would you like to, you know, uh, how? And, and then also uh, what is a big key with motivational interviewing is um, asking open-ended questions. Tell me how you currently manage your diabetes. Um, and then, you know, start to just get a feel for, it's almost like a funnel of starting really broad um, and then taking, let the patient take me where they want to go. And I think that one thing I try and also get across to, uh, especially the Latin community is, is thinking, uh, have them think about, because uh, a lot of the foods that they eat in their culture are plant-based foods, beans and rice um, and vegetables, uh, things like that are, are, are more Hispanic culture. So um, what I was seeing a, a lot in, let's say in the hospital setting was a diet based around a lot of processed foods, flour tortillas, um, eating, uh, you know, and Whataburger was, was founded in, in uh, Corpus Christi. So it ends up being when I dig down into their diet, it ends up being not really the, the, the diet that their ancestors ate, which is more of handmade types of meals, uh, Hispanic meals, it ends up being more of the standard American diet with a um, little bit of more of the Hispanic culture tied into it. Um, and then going into chronic renal disease, um, uh, CKD, there are different levels of chronic kidney disease. Um, and w one of the ways to avoid getting to end-stage renal disease um, is to give the kidney a rest, meaning let the kidneys not be overworked. Um, and so one of the things that causes a lot of stress on the kidneys is protein, especially animal protein, because the majority, a lot of people that I've had, uh, experience with, they still, um, the Americans, they, uh, American type of diet, they still have uh, this, um, this thought of wanting to always get a lot of protein in their diet because they think that they'll, they'll waste away or something. So um, you actually need to take in a lot less protein, um, anywhere from say like 0.4 to 0.6 grams per kilogram. So you can give the kidney a rest. Um, and so what's so great about a plant-based diet um, is that it's naturally lower in protein. When you switch to a plant-based diet, you will almost automatically go to a lower protein diet. But it's really the amount of protein that we should be eating 
because the recommended daily allowance for protein for just the average American is actually 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. So when you eat more of a, a Western style, American style diet that's more heavily uh, uh, centered around animal proteins, it can be a lot more than that. Um, and then second, one of the things that is one of the hardest uh, things that I find with my dialysis patients were, were that when they went to end-stage renal disease, then they needed to switch to a higher protein diet. So they needed, when they went from chronic kidney disease stage four to stage five, which is dialysis, you have to go from low protein to a higher protein diet. So yeah, so making that switch can be really hard because what I found with a lot of my patients uh, is two main things is that dialysis causes a reduction in uh, appetite with a lot of the patients. So they're eating less. And then second is phosphorus control. Our bodies have phosphorus, which is needed in the body. Um, and a lot of foods that are more animal-based and plant-based have phosphorus in it. But one of the things that can help control phosphorus is not necessarily just what's the amount that's in the um, the food that you're eating is the absorption rate. Um, and with animal-based proteins, uh, because it's the protein in animals is a, the enzyme uh, is, is a phytate enzyme. Our bodies don't have uh, the enzyme that breaks that down very well. So we don't absorb as much plant protein, I'm sorry, plant phosphorus as we do with animal or processed foods phosphorus. Um, and so uh, what I see again with a lot of patients is they have trouble controlling their phosphorus levels. They go up too high, which if their phosphorus levels are high, that can then combine with calcium levels. And when those things combine together in the bloodstream, then that can cause um, hardening in the arteries and potential cardiovascular problems like strokes and cardiovascular disease. So uh, one of my favorite books um, is The Plant-Fed Kidney uh, by Jennifer Moore. Um, so it talks a lot about um, how if you have chronic kidney disease, this is a great resource, or if you're on dialysis, on how adopting a plant-based diet um, and like I mentioned uh, earlier in the interview, um, the, one of the major dialysis uh, companies are telling their dietitians to promote plant-based diets. And at the dialysis clinic that I worked at about six months ago, the, our medical director said, we need to be promoting plant-based diets. And it was the first time I heard that at the company I worked at. Which, you know, I just, wow. you know, I was amazed. And, and so, but that had been what I'd been advocating for my patients the whole time because it allows their patients to um, get adequate protein, but keep the phosphorus levels low. Mm -hmm. That way they can avoid, which is like you mentioned, it's the number one killer is cardiovascular events. Right. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great um, way to, again, uh, give the kidneys a rest mm -hmm. by introducing plant-based proteins in the diet. Wow. And those can be beans, uh, legumes, tofu, which also helps with calcium levels, and whole grains. Um, so it's really a win-win when you switch to a plant-based diet. Right. Thank you for mentioning that book. I've never heard of that one. And also for just really going into detail about how we can support our kidneys. Also, um, since you are talking about some of the foods, I had a question about the glycemic index. If you are already diabetic, should diabetes patients still remain low on the glycemic index when it comes to fruit? Well, I don't think not necessarily. I think it, it, it needs to be individualized. It needs to be look at the individual situation um, because if you look at the Mastering Diabetes, which is a book um, by Robbie, um, Robbie Barbero and Cyrus Kambata. Um, it's got my little. Uh, but um, uh, so they're, they're both type 1 diabetic, diabetics and they eat 
a, a lot of fruit in their diet. Okay, so um, and so what when we think about fruit, um, it's really it's you know designed for us to eat. You know, we were designed as humans to eat fruit, um, and so. Uh, there are some foods that are fruits that are higher on the glycemic index. As an example, I know watermelon is higher on the glycemic index. Um, but what you should also take into account is glycemic load, which is the actual amount of that food combined with the actual food itself. So as an example, if I had two pieces of watermelon, it may not have a big impact on my blood sugars. But if I had a whole watermelon, Without any other foods, without any other proteins, without any whole grains in that meal, then it probably could have a higher impact on my sugars. So, um, so it needs to be individualized. Um, but the beauty of fruit is that, especially if you're an, an athlete um, or if you're wanting to exercise, that's one of our main fuel sources. Um, fruit and whole grains, carbohydrates are, are really, that's what our preferred fuel source in the body. Um, and so our bodies naturally will, and it has a perfect blend of potassium and vitamins and minerals, you know, wrapped up into this, you know, beautiful package of, let's say a banana or an apple. Um, and so it also has protein in it. So but the number one thing uh, that also comes along in that package is fiber. And so fiber really helps with blood sugar control. And so versus uh, if you take, let's say, an apple and if you juiced it, well, you're taking all that fiber away. So that will increase the impact of that on your sugar level. So um, I think you have to look at it as a as more of a whole, um, meaning that, you know, not too many. If you're having it as a snack, then it, you are eating it by itself. But second is take into account other things. Let's say if, say if you're having a meal um, and you're having a protein, like let's say garbanzo beans, you're having a starchy grain or I'm sorry, starchy vegetable, let's say like a sweet potato. Um, you're having your cruciferous vegetables, which are higher in, high in fiber, broccoli, uh, carrots. And then you're having your fruit um, at the end, that total package is what you should be looking, you, you can be looking at when it comes to blood sugar control. Um, but it needs to be very individualized. Um, uh, depends on probably someone's A1C, someone that has an A1C of six versus someone that has an A1C of 11. You know, they may, especially if they're on insulin, uh, they may, you know, may impact them, you know, someone differently. So. Uh, other things that come into play is maybe if you didn't have a good night's sleep that night, um, if you're high in stress, uh, if you have high stress levels, you know, there's a lot of things that come into play. So I think that using the glycemic index uh, and glycemic load um, is a useful tool, but um, it needs to be individualized uh, in looking at the full picture. Yes. Well, that makes sense. If you'd like to tell our listeners more about your programs and how they can sign up, please uh, share with us. Sure, sure. So um, I've just developed uh, what I think uh, is the future of medicine um, is personalized medicine uh, and really patient-centered medicine uh, and making dietitians and healthcare uh, professionals, health coaches more accessible to individuals. Um, and so I developed, I do have a, a, a private practice where I see people one-on-one uh, -on -one if you're in the Fort Worth area, uh, but to make myself more accessible, um, I developed an online nutrition program. Um, i am uh, just developed it recently, so it's my first time to develop something like that. Uh, my first course is, uh, is designed around uh, eating more plant-based and weight loss. Uh, it's called 10 Week uh, weight loss kickstart. Um, but it's a lot more about weight loss. It's about looking beyond the scale, looking at your total health. Um, it's 10 weeks long. Um, it's, uh, there are online courses. Uh, there'll be a weekly Zoom teaching where I teach live, but you can then watch the recording if you happen to miss it. So um, it's accessible. Um, so you don't have to drive to a clinic. You can just watch out of the comfort of your own home. Um, uh, it's 10 weeks long. There's support in that you, you know, get to meet with the, 
meet with me weekly for la- what we called laser coaching so we can design those specific small goals, uh, attainable goals. So you build that confidence, that self-reliance. Um, and so if you want more information about it, send me a message on Instagram. My Instagram handle is John Massingale Nutrition at, uh, on Instagram or send me an email at johngmass 17 at gmail.com are probably the two easiest ways to contact me. Um, and then from there, um, I'm, my plan is uh, to uh, do a 10 week course, probably three to four times a year uh, on different topics. Uh, hope to do one that's uh, more diabetes related. Um, and then I hope to do one more uh, lifestyle related. Uh, just the you know I'm planning to attend the the um, the, the conference later on in the, the year the Academy of Lifestyle Medicine conference that I hope that you guys are going is in Orlando in November so I'm really excited to be my first time to go so that's the plan is to to because I have uh, you know people that I've worked with in different areas of the state uh, that maybe don't have a plant based um, dietitian. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think that that's part of one of the things I want to work with, with you know, in, in the Dallas Fort Worth area as well, is making dietitians, healthcare professionals more accessible. Um, so uh, that way, because I, I, you know, just happened to be just starting with Baylor Scott and White, and uh, I didn't know it, but it's a great benefit. Uh, part of their wellness package is being able to meet with the dietitian. But not every comp- not everybody has that option. So, uh, so that is the the concept around you know telemedicine uh, and uh, being able to be more accessible uh, to individuals uh, in an online learning, which I think is is part of the future of, of medicine. Absolutely, it's super comfortable to be able to do this to to see your physician or your practitioner or your health coach, whoever it may be by Zoom, in the comforts right. of your own home. And we're very lucky to have you and to know you um, and that you're nearby here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area because we're often approached and asked if we know of a plant-based cardiologist and a you know, plant-based physician. And the truth of the matter is that we still lack a lot of specialists, but we always know, and I always feel the need to clarify, those individuals, those professional health care professionals are probably going to direct you towards a dietitian (laughs) because that's really how it works. And so I I really want to drive that message that, yes, while you may have a cardiologist who's on board with eating plant-based and all that, they don't really dedicate that much time when it comes to actually guiding you. They usually direct you to someone else they partner with, like a dietitian. And so the fact that you're able to offer these resources probably continually throughout the year online is great. And also that, you know, you offer it via telehealth and, um, and that you're at Baylor Scott. I'm actually on the outpatient basis. So I'm not in a hospital. I'll be working at a couple different clinics here okay. in Fort Worth. I'm going to be uh, at uh, a clinic in Saginaw, uh, mm-hmm. which is a suburb of Fort Worth, uh, North mm-hmm. Fort Worth, um, but also mainly at a clinic that's near downtown Fort Worth. So mm. uh, there'll be primary care physicians. And that's what I found is that it's a lot of, there's a lot of primary care physicians that have to manage their patients' diabetes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some of them, maybe that may not be their specialist. Um, just like I experienced at the dialysis clinic, the endocrinologist that specializes with kidneys was also managing their uh, their patients' diabetes, and they're not a sometimes sometimes a diabetes ex- expert. So, a lot of times the the dietitian and they're very taxed for time, um, meaning that they only have maybe five to ten minutes a lot of times with patients. So, um, the behavior change part of uh, in in really going through the diet part and the behavior change takes a lot of time. So. Mm-hmm. So I'll be supporting uh, primary care physicians that are Baylor Scott and White uh, physicians uh, in Fort Worth at a couple of different clinics. Yeah. Awesome. It sounds like you're finally in a place where you're really happy and you feel like you're you're really contributing to the health of the patients, unlike the other missed opportunities that you saw right. somewhere exactly. else. 
Is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? If you have a final message or anything else I didn't ask about? Uh, yeah. So I think that um, when we look at um, chronic disease, um, the, the last statistics I sh- shown was that the Centers for Disease Control, 86% of healthcare dollars are spent on treating chronic disease. Um, and, you know, really that's more of a sick care model. Um, and so uh, and what I'm seeing with patients is that patients are living longer, but a lot of those years they're living with increased disability. Um, and so really the focus needs to be on preventative um, early detection, uh, working with your primary care physician uh, so he can, you know, have like that talk like I got when I was in my mid-30s. Um, and then from there, uh, working uh, in, in, you know, stepping maybe outside of your comfort zone um, and, you know, working on uh, with a healthcare professional, whether it's a health coach or a registered dietitian. Um, and then from there, you know, it's taking, I think, the, those small steps because I think a lot of times what can be um, what causes a lot of people to not make lifestyle changes is that they think it's an all or nothing um, or it's a really big change in their life. I know personally it was just small changes, uh, but it was small, consistent changes over time um, is what has helped me, you know, uh, get to my ideal weight and to, to thrive. Uh, you know, I've done you know, an Ironman. I've, uh, I've done, I did the Calton marathon and, and uh, that's really, you know, if you, if you want to get off medications, uh, if you want to get off of uh, insulin, uh, if you want to get off of blood pressure medications, um, if you want to, uh, not to, uh, you know, have to go to physicians often, uh, physicians offices. Um, there is a choice. And, uh, the Danish twin study uh, says that, um, 20% of our future health can be di- dictated upon our genes and our genetics. And 80% is based on our lifestyle. So much, so much of this is in your hands and in your control. Um, so it's, it's really implementing a, a few small steps, um, and there is no one size fits all solution. And that's what I always try and tell patients: um, it's really finding what fits for you that helps you thrive and live a long life. So um, that's my, uh, and it, you don't have to be a vegan. Um, it, but I believe in uh, the more you move toward incorporating more whole foods, more plants the weight takes care of itself. Weight loss Mm. takes care of itself. Your health takes care of itself. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, you know, and I wish too that when, you know, that the family of that patient suffering with diabetes would all come on board to support the individual, because a lot of times we think, oh, well, that person's sick, so they have to eat this way as a result. And it's like, no, you may not want to be in their shoes, so you should come on board and support. And and not only that, the family member will feel supported if everyone makes this change together. And like you said, it's not that easy, which is why there are other resources on how you can get on board to incorporating more plant foods into your life and moving away from the processed foods. But John, this has been great. Thank you so much for supporting my listeners this way and talking to us about diabetes, which is such an important topic. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. I had such a rich conversation with John Massengale, and I thought that we could sort of recap some of those points that he made during the interview. Um, As you know, John is a registered dietitian who is certified as a diabetes care and education specialist. We learned that diabetes is the number one chronic condition that can be the most impacted by making dietary changes. As a matter of fact, I'd like to recommend that you visit episode 184 with Mark Ramirez. He came on the show to speak about how he reversed his diabetes. I think that you'll enjoy that. We also learned that if your hemoglobin A1C is between 5.7 and 6.4, meaning you're be- basically being checked for your blood sugar levels, you are considered pre-diabetic. 
You need to start making healthier lifestyle choices, my friends, to prevent conditions that can actually worsen. So if you're not doing your annual checkups, make sure that you do. And now also make sure that you get your A1C checked. So I asked John, what exactly is happening in the body when we're diabetic? He says that uh, number one, either the pancreas does not secrete enough insulin, and that's considered type 1 diabetes, or we have insulin resistance. This means that the cell doesn't recognize insulin. This would be considered type 2 diabetes. He gave us the example that's provided by the team of Mastering Diabetes, where he basically says that the insulin is trying to get into the cell, but it cannot get in. What are some of the signs of diabetes? There's fatigue frequent urination, thirst, and weight gain. While the pillars of lifestyle medicine can greatly help with improving diabetes, nutrition is the one pillar that most affects diabetes. He says that nutrition is the biggest piece of the puzzle. Like if you think of all the other pillars as being pieces of the puzzle, nutrition is the largest one. So what diet is recommended to improve diabetes? He says a plant-based diet, of course, consisting of legumes, fruits, and vegetables, and unrefined grains would be best. And as a matter of fact, one of the diets recommended by the American Diabetes Association is a vegan plant-based diet. Experiencing a 7 to 10% weight loss can help reduce insulin resistance, which then can help improve your A1C. I asked about the consequences of living with diabetes that is not properly damaged. Well, we learned that we can continue to feel tired and fatigued, but also over the course of time, we can actually develop chronic conditions such as cardiovascular disease, peripheral arterial disease, and even have a stroke. In addition, one can develop diabetic retinopathy, which damages the back of the eye, that's the retina, and can lead to blindness. There's a loss of feeling in the feet, also the loss of blood flow to the leg, which can then lead to potential amputations. John sees that there's an art to being a dietitian as he closely works with patients to discover their values and goals. He uses motivational interviewing for this process and helps them set SMART goals. These are goals which are realistic and doable. Providing diabetes education is key in helping patients take control of their health. Many times primary care physicians and endocrinologists find themselves trying to manage a diabetic patient. A registered dietitian can help to educate the patient towards reversing their diabetes to prevent renal failure. Two of the main causes of chronic renal disease are hypertension and diabetes, which both can be improved on a whole food plant-based diet. Once a patient has advanced chronic renal disease, they require dialysis. And at this point, a high-protein diet is recommended. Again, a whole food plant-based diet would be more ideal to increase protein intake, such as legumes, while minimizing phosphorus intake, which is found primarily in animal-based protein. John recommends the book, Plant-Fed Kidney, if you're interested in learning more about that. And finally, the CDC says that 86% of healthcare dollars are spent on treating chronic disease. It is a sick care model which doesn't work. We need to focus on prevention and early detection. John references the Danish twin study where it was shown that 20% of future health can be dictated by our genes. However, 80% of our health can actually be based on lifestyle choices. So much of this is in our control. My friends, you have more power over your health than what you've been told. Right now, you can prevent chronic conditions by simply choosing healthier lifestyle solutions. I hope that this conversation was useful. Again, I provided a sheet on diabetes. Simply go to bit.ly forward slash diabetes sheet to get more information about diabetes and also get some recipes. And I would love to hear from you. Please tell me what you think about this episode. Simply go to speakpipe.com forward slash HLS. And these links will be included in the show notes. And again, my friend, thank you for listening. You've been listening to the Healthy Lifestyle Solutions podcast with your host, Maya Acosta. If you've enjoyed this podcast, do us a favor and share with one friend who can benefit from this episode. Feel free to leave an honest review as well at ratethispodcast.com forward slash HLS. This helps us to spread our message. And as always, thank you for being a listener. 